So uh, as when we discussed the um, 2017 election, the story begins in the years before. Uh, if we go back to 2019, we had our very uninspiring federal election in May. Uh, the state government had some wins with the GST deal and improved finances. But uh, coming up to the end of um, 2019, views about the state government were positive, but a bit lukewarm. Uh, the financial improvements had come at some very real costs. There were substantial increases in taxes and charges, particularly electricity, and there was ongoing stringency in services, which uh, led to staff shortages, growing areas of unmet need in health, mental health, homelessness, education, and child protection. And we had the cap on public sector wage rises. And um, the economy was going poorly, by the lived experience standards of many people. So household incomes were lower, a lot of people had lost jobs, had reduced hours, cutbacks in their business, cost of living was rising, wages were not, uh, incomes were less secure, spending was down, a lot of empty shop fronts, even in businesses that were well known. Um, young people and graduates finding it hard to get jobs as were of course people in their 50s and 60s. So many people do not have a job, a job as such. A lot of people are in the gig economy, putting together several casual jobs, uh, long uh, short-term contracts, labour hire, or self-employed with very insecure incomes. So diversification in the economy has been important to people for many years. That's the next slide. So people were asking at the end of 2019, they were saying, where's the plan for jobs for the future? Uh, across all sectors, more downstream processing, more manufacturing, and also people wanted things to be looking at recycling issues and climate change. And there were big concerns about growing areas of unmet need in our services. So mental health, people have been talking about this to a rising degree in the community for some years, both hospital beds and community services in mental health and also children's mental health. Waiting times in the health system and capacity problems in emergency departments. Then we've got meth, domestic violence, homelessness, child protection and education. These were all things people were talking about. So they also felt uh, a lack of leadership. Scott Morrison was performing poorly on the bushfires and uh, Mark McGowan was seen as a steady leader. Uh, but often perceived as not doing much uh, because progress in a range of areas wasn't really seen by the public. And um, it was always like the third or fourth story buried down somewhere in the ABC News. So people weren't really understanding what was going on. Often people couldn't see much difference between Liberal and Labor. Uh, bills had also risen steeply under Labor. And we had people in outer suburban areas suffering from all of these problems that we've been talking about and uh, also lacking services and infrastructure. So big concerns about our outer metropolitan areas. There's also disengagement with politics because people feel that, or they were saying, they don't care about us. Uh, they care more about keeping their jobs than doing their jobs. And uh, men in industrial technical type professions in the outer suburbs, often blokes in uh, vans and utes with variable and insecure incomes. Uh, they felt that not much had changed for them and they were saying things like they do stuff all for us. So uh, these were the things we were confronting at the end of 2019. And uh, that was 15 months before the election. We had narrow margins in some marginal seats and some popular country members retiring. So um, then that happened. Uh, so 2020, coming out of the summer of bushfires, people are seeing the growing pandemic. In the week of the 13th of March, we all cancelled all the functions that had been planned. 20th of March, Australia closed its borders, um, international borders to all who are not citizens or permanent residents. April 3, Mark McGowan announced that WA's border would be closed from uh, midnight Sunday, April 5, and we saw those fairly dramatic scenes. So through all of this, there were battles over cruise ships, battles over border restrictions with Clive Palmer endorsed by Christian Porter and the federal government, 
uh, with Scott Morrison on many occasions and Lisa Harvey. And so it went on. Um, people saw Mark McGowan and Roger Cook giving press conferences day after day. And clearly there was a lot of cut through with people very interested. For those eligible for job seeker and job keeper, uh, there was a bit more cash and security than many have seen in the past. And uh, restrictions were lifted here while other places around Australia and overseas faced a rolling litany of terrible problems. So people were very aware here that it could change, that it could easily change. And they, to be honest, they still are. So um, through all this, there were concerns and potential problems and unknowns where things could have come unstuck. Would there be outbreaks? How well would we handle it? There were security guards at hotels, quarantine and mental health in quarantine was an issue, impact on various workforces to be managed, including mining, agriculture and hospitality. When we get to the next slide. So from September to December last year, we found a number of things in the polling we were doing. Mark McGowan's approval rating was at levels above 80% everywhere. And uh, there were substantial swings to Labor, big increases in Labor's first preference votes, like first preference votes that we haven't seen for a very long time. High swings in the outer suburbs and the vote for the minor parties was small, not interested in One Nation anymore. Uh, and Labor, very importantly, was seen as better on improving the WA economy and better on jobs. And that was something that had really not shifted for years. That was one of the areas where people were not really hearing what was being done. But that had changed very significantly. Soft voters also became a very different bunch. So previously soft people were now uh, firm in their vote for Labor and previously firm Liberal voters were considering Labor. Uh, but it re remained very important to consolidate the Labor vote. So what people were saying on the twin key issues of managing coronavirus and the economy and jobs, the government had done very well on both. Keeping COVID out had enabled people to get on with their lives and their livelihoods. Uh, it also kept our mining industry going. Shutdowns in the mining industry are not a good idea. Uh, and protected our indigenous elders, which is an issue that not many people necessarily focused on, but was very important. But a lot of people face serious issues with their businesses and their jobs, elderly parents in nursing homes, and people possibly losing their rentals. But through all of this, many people felt a really strong sense of the community pulling together and helping each other. Really, the community was lifting through all of this. And I'd have to say it's very important to understand this extraordinary level of approval for Mark McGowan when we hear that number. In 35 years of measuring these things, we have never seen support for a popular leader uh, at those levels. Popular premiers in the past may have got into the 60s, never, never up into the 80s and high 80s. And obviously a lot of people said they'd done a good job managing COVID and the economy. But the central truth of the response lies in those sources of disillusionment that I was talking about uh, when we were looking at 2019. So in focus groups, we had very uh, middle income people and they were saying, he's done a great job. He's looked after the ordinary person. And the woman nearest me looked me in the eye and said, he put us first. And I thought, hmm. <laughs> I've actually heard what's being said here you know, and the, the emotional level at which it's being said. So if you put up the next slide, uh, Phil, and um, people said, and uh, he, he copped a lot of hate for it. It's been a long battle. And among those long disaffected men in industrial technical jobs in the outer suburbs, i.e. the blokes in Utes, their view had also completely changed. Uh, and they also relate to the dogged determination and the often blunt style. You know, he says what he means and he means what he says. So they connected with that. We also had um, this previous one, Phil. Uh, that's it. Um, 
we had people leaving comments like this, recording comments like this on our surveys when we said to people, what should the uh, state government be doing? And they said, uh, I think he's done a marvellous job and I'll vote for him any time. I'm very thankful we have Mark McGowan. Now uh, that's a vote switcher from Eton in Bunbury. And there's just a whole range of comments like that, that you can see there. And we just, in the normal um, grind and grumble of politics, you do not get people saying stuff like that with the sort of passion as well that um, they were saying it. So it's very remarkable. And it's the opposite of the cynicism that we usually see in politics. So people were saying, for once, the politicians are not sleeping so that we can. And uh, I think that's, you know, very central to this. So um, also moments like the kebab thing made him more relatable to young people. Even after six months, uh, people in focus groups who might not pay a huge attention, a huge amount of attention to who the leader of the opposition even is, says Lisa Harvey said to open the borders. Uh, so I'm afraid she got cut through on that and people, a lot of people just dismissed the Liberals completely after that. She was in a lot of trouble with her border stance and her history of changing policies. So the Liberals replaced her with Zach Kirkup, who appeared to be young and energetic, if inexperienced, and possibly more progressive with some interesting ideas. Soft Liberal voters also endorsed um, moving to take the health advice rather than the PM's advice on uh, borders. Uh, there were serious problems with disunity among the Libs and they're not seen as having any clear policies. So coming up to Christmas, people felt that the state government would definitely be returned. However, they were in a positive mood and they're looking for plans and promises. They would be very disappointed with politicians who wanted to vote based only on what was wrong with the others. So they had very clear concerns about jobs, economy, small business, future for young people who are badly impacted by the uh, pandemic and those areas of unmet need in services such as uh, our concerns in health, mental health, homelessness and, child, and climate change. Also, coming out of the pandemic, an increased focus on getting manufacturing here and the problems of insecure employment uh, and the importance of the lowest paid and most insecure workers, such as carers and retail workers, uh, to keep the community running was very much in people's minds. People were saying, isn't it amazing? We've seen how important these people are and they've got the casual wages and the insecure work. So people want to see plans for training and jobs and not just um, in construction and mining. And also we can't have people working in casual employment all over the place. Now from the Libs, they were looking for, for them to put forward some solid policies and to re-establish themselves. They were expecting that Zach Kirkup was there to connect better with young people and that he would gain experience and exposure through the campaign and potentially it would be game on next time as Mark McGowan had established himself during the 2013 campaign. Uh, so looking at the campaign itself, uh, there's the, the next slide. Not that one, if we go back a bit to the problems with the Liberal campaign, that's it. So um, in January, I think Zach Kirkup spoke in a way that uh, reflected what people in focus groups were saying, but he wasn't connecting it in any way with the way the Liberals usually uh, speak, so it didn't have much credibility. We had a lockdown at the start of Feb, that was negative for some people, so not all plain sailing. But from there, the Libs ran a chaotic campaign that uh, changed a number of times and fundamentally failed to understand what people are looking for and how they think. So a lot of the things they said were really at odds with what people believe uh, and how people feel. So many aspects of the Liberal campaign undermined any sense that people could believe in their principles or in their, compet in their competency. Um, there were actually a number of issues where the Liberals could have mounted much more effective criticisms of the government than what they did. And if they'd consistently promoted some policies around those, 
uh, that would have been much more successful for them, but they didn't seem sufficiently interested. Things were said once and then not heard again. Their renewable energy policy, um, it caused a big splash, but it received a lot of criticism from commentators and, and uh, people in the media. It was barely discussed by the Liberals after that. The failure to cost their policies seemed to leave them unable to talk about them to avoid um, questions about the cost. So uh, if we look at that policy, you have to say that people, including soft Liberal voters, are very interested in innovative plans around renewable energy. The problem was not that it was a green policy. The problem was that it was a bad policy. Uh, so a good policy would need to have been presented months before the election, so it could have been scrutinised and discussed in the way Metronet was. Metronet was discussed five or six months, released five or six months before the election. It also needed to be a well thought out policy. It obviously seemed to have big problems like lots of high tension wires and um, maybe it involved public investment, private profit and high cost. Um, so it didn't really appeal to anyone. Then we have Zach Kirkup's concession that the Liberals could not win the election, which was entirely disastrous for the Liberal campaign. It was widely interpreted as giving up by Liberal voters, and it also marked the end of the Liberals discussing policies at all, which was the biggest problem with it. Um, their lines became, don't give Labor total control, which is quite Trumpy language, and we need to be there to hold Labor to account for when they go too far, believed by nobody ever about the McGowan government. So, <laughs> um, and not to make sure they address ambulance ramping and to look after small business, et cetera, which were things they could have said. It also gave people time to examine that claim, and I'm sure William will have some things to say about this. People didn't want the status quo uh, with a lot of nitpicking and pointless obstructionism. Uh, Labor having control of both houses, not a scary prospect. And some people voted for it. People actually became more educated about the upper house as a result of this whole conversation. Um, and they remember the unrepresentative obstructionism around voluntary assisted dying. They also rejected do nothing politicians who had assumed that things couldn't go backwards after 2017 from a Liberal standpoint. The Liberals also could obviously could not have had a worse week, final week rather. Um, Zach Kirkup's final statement that he would not re-enter Parliament if he lost his seat undermined any perception that Zach Kirkup was fighting hard for convictions uh, and that his policies or principles would endure in any way past the election. So there was nothing for Liberal voters to vote for, essentially. Um, next slide, Phil. Let's see if we... But uh, Labor would not have done so well if they had a threadbare set of commitments um, on some assumption that they were going to win. A plan was needed and those unmet needs had to be addressed, particularly with the surplus and the fiscal restraints on wages that had been shown in the public sector. So while the economy was seen to be going well, it's about the future. The plans for jobs, training and increasing manufacturing in WA were very important. And also I've just put some of the things that were also promised up there. Um, I must say young people moved much more solidly towards Labor once those messages on jobs and training were heard. But we also had very important commitments on health. We've got that $361 million mental health package, uh, redevelopment of Peel Health Campus, many regional health initiatives, 400 more nurse graduate positions, thank goodness, 300 more uh, beds, including 100 in EDs. We waited a while for that one. <laughs> that promise, I think, came through in the last week. And the new Women and Babies Hospital. Also in education, money to upgrade infrastructure, then a lot for uh, vet programs in school 
training programs, TAFE, freezing TAFE fees, 300 additional apprenticeships and uh, 100 additional psychologists in WA schools, all that very important. And one could equally put up, there was a whole range of promises in community services and lots of other portfolios as well, and lots of detailed commitments in local areas. So at the end of the day, Labor was on track at the coming into Christmas. We're on track for a good five to seven uh, percent swing with various seats in um, contest, hopefully right up to South Perth, which is what we were thinking at that point. Um, but it was turned into a tsunami uh, by the Liberals, state and federal, showing themselves to be hopelessly out of touch. Um, they didn't give Liberal voters anything to vote for. And in the last week, people were saying to us, I'm switching uh, to Labor. Um, Labor have done a better job and the Liberals are on a different planet. So um, Labor had a strong plan, as we've talked about, local campaigns put in the hard work to engage people and communicate uh, all of those things. And there was no complacency uh, over the expectations of any sort of easy victory. Just a couple of misconceptions to avoid that I sort of annoyed me along the way with what's been said. Climate change and, and the environment uh, among, I think there probably is another slide there. Yep. Climate change uh, and the environment are among the top issues that people are very concerned about and rising, and yet the Green vote went backwards. It has nothing to do with uh, the importance that people place on climate change. People were saying to us that they didn't know who any of the Greens were or what their policies were. So it's about developing the policies and engaging with people on them. Also, this idea that Mark McGowan um, capitalised on secessionist thinking in WA. It's, maybe it's a, ca a catchy headline, but um, very inaccurate. West Australians are as ferociously Australian as anyone else. And uh, they do want their politicians to stand up for WA. That is actually the core phrase, because they feel um, that there's a long held tendency to disregard the needs of West Australians or, or even to fundamentally fail to understand them. So for once the tyranny of distance was to WA's advantage, why not use it? That's what it boiled down to. None of these people have said what advantage the advantage would have been to most West Australians for the borders to have been handled any differently from what they were. So the community um, did have strong views on that level. If it's a good idea, do it and um, don't be dictated to. So unfortunately, that sort of headline was another example of saying that West Australians subscribe to silly ideas um, rather than sensible ones. Uh, so the state government now left with some very big issues to address with the huge pressure on our hospitals and mental health services. Uh, also homelessness and the rental crisis that we have at the moment and affordable housing and social housing needed as well as delivering to meet the many expectations that are out there. So um, on that last slide, I think there was uh, a survey that we were doing in the last week. We were getting very, very big uh, vote for Labor. 73% said Labor has the better plan for the future. Um, but those are the very important issues that they want to see um, the government addressing, which are all of the things that we've been talking about. Good. Okay, for the next 20 to 25 minutes, I, my job is to analyze something that defies analysis. <laughs> this election was a black swan event, as they say these days. <laughs> We, I was going to have a picture of Nicholas and Sam Taleb in a fat tail and a black swan, but I thought better of it. Um, the, um, we, well, not we, but um, political scientists these days, the, the fashion is to try to come up with election forecasting models in which you have a range of inputs and out of the inputs comes your assessment of what the result's going to be. And uh, I think if you tried one of them, the result would have broken down. No forecasting model would have produced anything remotely like this result. 
because this was an election in which an externality crashed into the system and kicked it to pieces and made a nonsense of the whole thing. Nonetheless, I can at least look at the election results after the event and attempt to discern patterns within the swing to see if particular demographic groups were behaving in particular ways and maybe see if there are any lessons to be drawn from for, for the federal sphere, which of course is the, the next big issue on everyone's agenda. So uh, can we knock it along to whatever I've got on my first page? All right, so here's an attempt to sort of put it into some sort of historic context. Okay, so to, all right, I've run out, having used my black swan metaphor, here's a new metaphor, the perfect storm. This is a result you would not get unless absolutely everything went right. And I think the fundamentals were all in Labor's favour to begin with. And I think this, this came in through what Karen was saying, that maybe people weren't super ecstatic about the performance of the government before COVID-19, but everything pointed towards the kind of result that uh, the, the dedicated election result watcher has seen unfold a number of times at state over election, elections, certainly over the last two decades, which as I say here, was a long, land, a long line of landslide wins for first term state governments seeking re-election, which in pretty much every case here, with the exception of Tasmania 2002, were governments that came into power in rather unconvincing style. With the exception of Tasmania 2002, all the ones I've got here were elected as minority governments. So, you know, you, you just make it over the line in 99, Labor, uh, New South Wales, Victoria 2002, uh, the, the preceding elections, Labor had, had just made it in and just managed to unseat the preceding government. Then having been thrown into opposition, we saw this pattern play out time and time again. The, the Liberal Party in, in almost every case here, or is it actually every case? Um, yeah. Um, in every case, the opposition were thrown into disarray. They uh, had had government snatched away from them. All of their benefactors had lost interest in them and weren't donating money to them anymore. And they were thrown into turmoil over the succession to the leadership and were inward looking. And, you know, that classic thing that Karen said, that they weren't focused on the electorate, they were focused on themselves. In the meantime, you had a Labor government who, you know, in invariably they'd govern well. You know, you can't leave that aside. But uh Three to four years later, uh, it was no choice at all as far as the voters were concerned. You've had a first term landslide. The only aspect of that which I wouldn't apply to the current election was that Labor didn't just scrape in in 2017. Nonetheless, uh, everything about the classic first term landslide re-election win seemed to be in place even before COVID-19 came along and notwithstanding that people may have had a few grizzles and gripes as they undoubtedly did on all the, all the occasions I've listed here on my first bullet point. It also helps to have a government of the opposite stripe in power federally. You can turbocharge that if the government's unpopular, but any federal government at all, it's wind in your sails. You see the same phenomenon at by-elections. It's taken for granted that, the federal, that, that a government's going to have a swing against it if there's a by-election, just about. And by the same token, I think for a certain, without wanting to overstate this, it's, I don't think there are that many people who say, well, here's an opportunity to take a swing at the federal government, but it does happen. And it's an image problem for the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, party that's incumbent at the federal level if the, the state government are weighed down by all of the political negatives to an extent of the federal government, which is presumably why my list is dominated by Labor governments of all of these landslide wins. WA 2013, that's the only Liberal government on my list. It's the only case, and I think the reason for that fundamentally, maybe there's a dynamic, maybe things play out differently for Liberal versus Labor, but I think it's simply more to do with the fact that Labor have been in the in, in opposition at federal level more often than not. And therefore, most of these examples are, are Labor governments. So, uh, okay, and the only exception to this pattern 
The only example I can give you of a government that wasn't elect re-elected in a landslide, first term state government, when the federal government was a party of the opposite stripe, uh, that's an important qualification. Campbell Newman got voted out after three years. Uh, no doubt he's the author of his own demise, but I think Tony Abbott gave him a help. So Victorian government got voted out in 2014. That was another situation where, you know, maybe they'd have made it over the line if it had been a Labor government, but they were gone then. And by that time, Tony Abbott was led in the Liberal Party saddlebags. So when you have all of these conditions in play, the only example I can name where you've got a first term government, federal government of the opposite partisan complexion, the only disappointing result for an incumbent government to that extent was 2005 when Labor won. They, they, they won reasonably comfortably in 2005, but it wasn't a landslide. I would suggest that that had a lot to do with the fact that the West Australian were bashing Labor from pillar to post, both in that election campaign in 2008. They loom very large in our local media uh, ecosystem. And that didn't happen this time. You know, you didn't, no doubt people with an investment in Labor politics might have their, their grizzles and gripes about the West Australian or about 6PR, but it was nothing like what was going on in 2005 and 2008. The West Australian especially knew which way the wind was blowing, that they couldn't alienate their audience, that their audience were overwhelmingly pro-Labor, uh, you know, no doubt it'll be a problem that will emerge one day in future. But for, for the for, for the time being, this was an occasion where if the Western Austra West Australian had wanted to bash Labor, they, there is only so far they can drag their own audience. And I think the, br the breeze was blowing very heavily in a particular direction. Furthermore, and this is, you know, a, a flippant uh, dismissal of uh, what's been discussed in much greater length and detail by Karen already, there were no obvious political or economic reasons why this election should be any different. Yes, uh, Karen did go into a certain amount of disaffection with the way people felt the economy was, and absolutely that's uh, a situation. It's, it's, it's an endemic thing, though. It's not specific to this government. Furthermore, these were all the reasons that Barnett got voted out in the first place. They weren't, I think, likely to be much of a vote changer. Because if you were had all of those concerns about being part of the gig economy, of struggling, and you know all of the, the things that the the neoliberal revolution has wrought, voting, putting a liberal state government in power is not going to solve those problems for you. So I don't think that they were going to be vote changes for that many people. It was at worst a marginal thing. And that is even before the game changer of the next slide, which, all right, the, the content of the next slide more to the point. The COVID-19 factor, I you know, don't need to belabor this. It's perfectly obvious that COVID-19 changed everything. And that is the reason I think why we saw at this election a landslide piled upon a landslide. Two successive elections at which there were basically a 12 to 13% swing to Labor. I think before COVID-19, Labor would have held their ground and that would have been remarkable enough. You know, for Labor to have repeated their result in 2017, by any measure, that would, would have been an extraordinary result. You know, it would have been like Neville Rand's landslides of 78 and 81. That would have been a good analogy for it. You know, a really fantastic result followed by another one holding your ground. That double landslide, though, uh, is something else. And it's here we enter territory that defies analysis. You do not get executive, executive. Consecutive, successive, to 12 to 13% swings, or at least I thought you didn't, and before now I would have told you it was literally impossible. And you know, that shows that I'm, you know, hidebound in a world of, 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 of forecasting models and all of their limitations. So let's have a sort of broader think about this. Let's compare this result to other COVID-19 elections. There have been a fair few of them in the antipodes now. And they have all seen governments returned. I've given you the litany here. Queensland, New, South, New Zealand, Australian Capital Territory, the Northern Territory, four elections now where the incumbents, all Labor governments, funnily enough, is that a coincidence? I don't know, probably. But nonetheless, it is the fact that 
we have seen one incumbent government after another returned in reasonably good to very good fashion. It was only the New Zealand result that was in any way comparable to what happened in Western Australia, and even then it falls short. And it was a fantastic picture I could just send her out, and she won the first ever majority since New Zealand moved to a proportional representation on electoral system, which they did in 1996. That means you have to get 50% of the vote to win 50% of the seats. Again, with my constricted cutting off blood supply to my head, it can, it, uh, election forecasting model on, I'd have said it was just about impossible for a major party to get 50% in the modern age. We live in an age of partisan dealignment. We live in an age where people are a lot more receptive to minor parties, just whether or not they're attached to those minor parties or looking to kick against the system generally. Uh, and uh, as a result, very difficult to get to 50%, not impossible, but very diff difficult. Uh, Jacinda Ardern did it, and that was a uh, symptomatic of how dominant she is within the New Zealand political space since COVID-19 came along. 10% short, however, of what Labor managed in Western Australia. She just managed a shade over 50%, and WA just a shade under 60%. So a 10% difference on top of an extraordinary result. What was different between Western Australia and New Zealand? I think you would have to say that this was largely self-inflicted wounds by the conservative side of politics. Um, uh, Liza Harvey, I uh, want to blame here for this. She was at the helm when she decided that there would be uh, political ground to be made up by putting daylight between her uh, position on COVID and the government's. Very big, very bad call from which every opposition in Australia has since learned. Uh, Peter Malinowskis, the uh, opposition leader in South Australia, put out an absolutely groveling aconicum, whatever, whatever the word is, um, to the government when they clamped a uh, lockdown on in South Australia a couple of months ago. He was absolutely determined to let everybody know that they were, Labor was, would not have done one tiny little thing different. Uh, Victoria is a counterexample. Michael O'Brien, I, I probably would have done the same in his position, wanted to make political capital out of the disaster that they had in Victoria in the middle of last year. Turned out he'd have been better off not doing that. Um, you know, he had Sky News and the Herald Sun cheering him on. It's easy to see how you could have been deceived. But in hindsight, I think if he had his time again, he would have been less aggressive in his treatment of Daniel Andrews during that period and just left it to the, the Murdoch press to take care of that. So I would lay the blame on Liza Harvey. I'd also lay the, lay the blame on Clive Palmer. I might chew Karen's ear off about this. I'd be interested to know how much his name was coming up in focus groups. Oh, yeah, OK. I'm pleased to hear that because Clive Palmer has been trying desperately to affect an election result for a great experience for a very long time. Congratulations, Clive. You've done it now. <laughs> coming up. May the 1st, I would watch this one with considerable interest because Peter Gutfein, it's how he should pronounce his name, but I think he pronounces it Gutwein. Um, the Premier of Tasmania, sorry if there are any Tasmanians on Zoom, um, has recorded, uh, him and Mark McGowan have stood apart in terms of their approval ratings throughout the COVID-19 crisis. Every leader, every incumbent leader has had a rocket charged up their approval rating. Scott Morrison's starting to come off, which is interesting. But uh, certainly there was a big COVID-19 boost for every incumbent leader. They were all, and this came through on what Karen was saying, um, Mark McGowan and, uh, was, was on the news every night and people were watching. They were interested to hear what he had to say. It affected their lives. And all of a sudden, we've got a leader who appears to be in charge and is describing uh, events of great significance to the, the, the lives of the audience and isn't just a politician blathering with sound bites. They're telling you things you need to hear. It's a good situation to be in as an incumbent. You're authoritative. You're relating news that needs to hear. And the opposition, not just the opposition, minor parties as well, get frozen out of the, 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 the mind space, the limited mind space that most voters actually have for politics. So Peter Gutwein, Gutwein is um, stood apart, as I said, uh, a comparable level of success in keeping COVID-19 out 
and uh, a real sense that he'd taken control of the situation and done what needed to be did. So both of them had uh, approval ratings in the 80s, and now he has pulled on an early election. He saw what Mark McGowan did and said, well, I'll have some of that. So he's called an election a year ahead of time. That's a problem for him. Mark McGowan was uh, fortunate in that he didn't have to bring on an early election to the, the electoral cycle coincided with the uh, with political fortunes. And uh, that's a bit of lead in his saddlebags that he has cynically called an early election. Nonetheless, it will be interesting to compare the result on May the 1st with the result on March the 13th and uh, see the extent to which uh, this has been replicated by the Liberal Party and post facto will be able to sort of say, right, how different was the result? To what extent did he fall short of Labor? What was different? So I kind of wish I'd had the Tasmanian election before this one, but nonetheless, stay tuned. I'll write about it on my blog. Uh, next slide. All right, so while the election looked like a tidal wave, there was a certain amount of geographical variability with the, with the force with which it hit. And this is a colour-coded map, which I have ripped off the website of Ben Rowie, tallyroom.com.au. Um, should do my own work, no doubt, but we'd have come up with the same result either way. This is a colour-coded map showing how the vote, the, the, the swing varied throughout the metropolitan area. The deeper the red, the bigger the swing. And while there's a certain amount of messiness there, I think you do get a picture that in the kind of coastal urban core, the shades of red tend to be lighter and they uh, tend to be bigger, particularly in that northern coastal corridor, which is where elections are traditionally won and lost. Not this time, you know, but um, not even in 2017 so much because they were particularly big landslides. But ordinarily, if you want to win election, state election in Western Australia, win those seats in the Northern Coastal Corridor. They swang, swung, especially forcefully. So I think that's the thing that, that, that comes through apart from a couple of outliers here and there. What have I got on my next slide? Sorry, that was uh, bad timing. A chart with a lot of numbers. Yeah, I know, too many. Um, but I just want to sort of show you what I've done and then explain to you what I think it means. Um, how much time have I got there? All right, you're not going to be tested on this. All right, this is a regression model that attempts to... I've got 450 polling booths here and I'm trying to come up with a model which finds variables which explains the Labor swing or what I call the coalition defection rate. The percentage of voters within the, the community that flip their vote from Liberal to Labor or coalition to Labor. In some places it was more than others. Um, what we want to look at here, you know, obviously this is a this is a number salad, but the important thing is the stuff at the top, the names of the rows at the top, and whether the numbers next to them are positive or negative. What we've got here is MFY, that's median family income. I've got a positive correlation on median family income. That means that more affluent areas tended to have a bigger movement to labor. You were more likely to change your vote. Big qualification coming up on that point, though. Unless you were one of the seats, which I've included down there, and that includes all your classic humdinger big income electorates, Churchlands, Nedlands, Cottesloe. The member for South Perth begs to differ. The member for South Perth begs to differ. I need to come up with a narrative to why South Perth isn't an outlier here. No doubt, maybe the vitality of the Labor campaign and the talent of the... <laughs> um, I don't know. I'll think about it later. My point, however, is that I do think that to a certain extent, Zach Kirkup's policy on renewable energy was designed to bring some of those seats back. And congratulations, he's exceeded to the tune of two seats. So if Tony, if Tony Abbott were here, which I assume he isn't, if Tony Abbott were here, he would say, ah, oh, but you lost the tradies. You lost Howard's battlers, who aren't battlers at all. But um, you, I, I, I think there is, and, and it's come through in my positive coefficient for income. 
Once you take away the areas where the professionals live, the doctor's wives live, as it was fashionable to say back in about the 2004 sexist term, sorry, it was in use. Um, the uh, blue-green kind of liberal voter tended to cling on, but in affluent elect electorates that were outside that inner urban zone, where you have the really classic blue liberal, blue ribbon liberal seats, Although it's interesting that in seats like Higgins in Victoria, the, the Liberals hold is starting to loosen here. I think we're seeing a kind of realignment away from simple, you know, class-based politics towards a kind of, you know, globalised in a metropolitan vote versus a nationalist sort of vote. It seems to be the new cleavage that's emerging. That's being shaken up. Zach Kirkup, I do think it had at least some uh, success with his attempt to keep that kind of inner metropolitan core on board. Uh, to go through the other coefficients that are important, age zero to 14, a big coefficient. This is the proportion of the population of the electorate that are in effect children. Labor did really well in seats with lots of children. And this is what we're seeing with the uh, outer urban effect, that deep red we saw in the Northern Corridor. This is what that looks like if you turn it into a mind-bogglingly confusing jumble of numbers. Those areas, and this, I've broken this down into polling booth levels, so it's less crude. This is an analysis of polling booth results rather than electorate results. So I can pick up quite a lot of nuance. It's quite simply, the more young families there were in an, electro, in, an, in an area, the more heavily it swung to labour. In a sense, that's not such a surprise. Those areas are typically the most volatile. When the swing is on, those are the areas that swing most heavily. And that's why the northern suburbs tend to be where elections are won and lost in Western Australia. It's where the swing packs a double punch when it's on. And those are the seats that fall and deliver the, the majority to whichever party is getting its way. Um, I should probably move on, except I don't know what to make of the fact that the speak English only variable is negative. It seems that Labor tended to do better in areas with high immigrant populations. I don't understand that. In fact, if anything, I'd have thought the opposite would have been true, but that's a conversation starter for a later time. Uh, if we move on, we'll probably find an itemised account of everything I've just said. I didn't mean to, to dwell on that slide. It was just there to show you that I'd done the work. <laughs> For every $1,000 of medium family income, Labor gained an extra 2% of coalition voters. After you've controlled for the fact that those inner area seats didn't behave like this, but nonetheless, there was an effect there, a modest one. Uh, this really translates into a 1% swing. $1,000 is the difference between a middling electorate and a really rich one. Not for the first time, there was a divide between professionals and affluent trade workers. And, you know, you hear this a lot whenever the Liberals win an election, that, that Labor, a federal election, that Labor have lost touch with their tradie base because they're aspirational and all of the rest. We saw that kind of divide play out here. This time, however, it was the affluent trade workers who swung to Labor. Ordinarily, the moral of the story is that Labor needed to let go of inner city green politics and all of the rest and do what... Joel Fitzgibbon says. But on this occasion, it was the case that Labor did do especially well among those kinds of workers. Um, no observable distinction. The swing was bigger in the metropolitan area. Why, I don't know. Probably uh, maybe if you're in the city, something like COVID-19 looms larger. You know, yeah, there's a sort of sense that you've got a greater health risk. I'm just throwing that out there. I would, might, might have thought that the Nationals would have done better, that they'd have done a better job at clinging on to their, their, their vote base. But that didn't seem to be what was happening at this election. I think what did happen at this election is that the Nationals did do pretty well in their wheat belt heartland. Not so long ago, their wheat belt heartland was all they had. But under Brendan Grills, they did a tremendously successful campaign to spread into non-agricultural regions. They were winning seats like Pilbara. 
they were winning seats like Cal Kalgoorlie. Yeah, they won that for one term. There were a number of examples. That's all gone now, and it finished evaporating with this election. Labor did very well in those sorts of seats that the Nationals had made inroads into. They made inroads. They did not plant deep roots in those areas. They still have deep roots in the wheat belt, and the, the, that, that's now the majority of, of non-Labor seats in the house it's central wheat belt it's more it's is there another one row so those three seats i think there's another one in the mix i lost warren blackwood but i yeah that's where central yeah they did cling on there and that kind of goes against my argument unfortunately because that's not in the wheat belt but all right i'll think about that one later okay do i have another slide i think i'm probably nearing how long have i got Opinion polling. I've got a, I have a self-interested uh, desire to give a boost to opinion polling because my headline here says it all. People had too much faith in opinion polls before the 2019 federal election. Now they've got too little. And this election showed that they do showed their worth. Opinion polls are capable of mentioning of measuring something that no one else can see and which frankly no one else would believe. This election result was more or less seen by the opinion polls. I think the, the late pre-election night polls were a little bit shy of where Labor ended up. The final news poll was 66.34. It ended up being 69.70. I don't think you can complain about though. That's a pretty good effort. And it is a particularly good effort when people, and we also saw, I think I've mentioned that Gareth Parker said on Insiders, the morning after the election that he'd spoken to a quote unquote Siebel, that senior Labor minister, who had said that they simply weren't believing what their traffic that their, their tracking polls were saying. So clearly, both tracking polling, the internal polling being conducted by the parties, and the published polling were producing results and sort of spinners in the week before the camp the election were saying, well, yes, obviously Labor are headed for a landslide, but that can't happen. The word on, among it's in, in the final week of the campaign, uh, sources on both sides of politics were telling journalists, look, we think the Liberal seat count will be in the high single figures. And it ended up being two. They should have, they should have taken their polling at face value. Polling did a good job. 3% askew, funnily enough, they were also 3% askew at the federal election. Every poll before on the eve of the federal election said 51.5, 48.5 in favour of Labor. Turned out they had the parties the wrong way around. They were only 3% off. 3% off is a perfectly normal polling error in America. We do better than that here. Probably compulsory voting is the reason. But here, you know, I think you have to say that, you know, the backlash against polling has gone too far. And uh, one of the consequences of the backlash against polling is that there was absolutely none of it in Western Australia in the entire four years of the first term of the Mark McGowan government. There was one poll, I think, in the Sunday Times. And then there was a second poll in October last year, gauging a couple of marginal seats. There wasn't a single news poll state Western Australia throughout the four years of the government. And, uh, you know, this hurts my feelings. It gives me, it makes it harder for me to write blog posts and it makes me have to work harder, which, you know, is obviously very upsetting to me. So I think that's pretty much it. I've got one more slide, but it was only there if I needed it. Federal implications. Well, you know, I don't know. Are there any time will tell? Speaking of opinion polls, News poll had a state breakdown last week, which said, oh, out of nowhere, there's this huge swing to Labor. Labor are 53.47 ahead in Western Australia, federally. They haven't been in that position since 1983. However, my this is something I can sort of tell you out with a bit of authority. Whenever there's a state election blowout, some of it leaks into federal polling. And then three or four months later, it's gone. So the immediate blowout that you've seen in news poll, I don't expect to remain. I don't think you'll see Labor having a established 5347 lead in Western Australia. Having said that, I think the whole COVID-19 experience has been invaluable for Labor's brand. 
And it, I think, has gone a long way to negate the idea that Labor are a little bit distant from Western Australian concerns, being the sort of party of, you know, big government. I sort of want to centralise everything in Canberra. Now we've seen the, uh, I think the Morrison government kicked a big own goal in not, you know, putting their foot down about Clive Palmer's legal challenge from the, from the get-go. And this also came through in something Karen said, a feeling that it's now Labor that's standing up in Western Australia. The Liberal Party have traditionally been able to make a, a very successful populist appeal to voters in Western Australia. We're the party that stands up for WA. We're the party of states' rights. I suspect that it will be a big boost to Labor at the next election. Unfortunately, there aren't too many seats federally for Labor and WA. Swan sort of 3%. Beyond that, they're going to have to look at a sort of 1983 style swing. I'll believe that when I see it. But I've said that a lot of times in relation to the state election and indeed we saw it. So thank you very much.